Good morning. Um, I know that some of you, uh, or some of the people who are not here, probably think that this is going to be just a repetition of what I said uh, for Gatsby, <laughs> but it's actually going to be an extension and uh, focusing on some on very different topics that I never talked about before. So uh, those who are not here will probably miss something. Uh, so uh, again, uh, this is uh, something that I've been pursuing for many, many years. And there are many people that uh, contributed to my insights and understanding uh, that I'm going to share with you. I just listed all the people that worked directly or indirectly on, on this topic with me, from starting from the old times at Bell Labs, uh, Mr. Fernando Pereira, uh, and where everything actually started in the 80s, through uh, a long list of students and non-students. Maybe I just should point out this. So the, the, main, the main insights I guess are getting from Fernando, Bill, and Ilya. Amir Globerson had actually a lot to do with many of the techniques that I'm talking about. Noam Slonim, Dimitri, who did a lot of uh, work that I just want to mention on the slide, and Felix, Jonathan Anoha, Daniel Polani to some extent, Pedro Ortega last year, and then the list of my current students, and especially Nori, Nadav, Taz, and Noga were just starting to work on it, but already helped me a lot. <laughs> so, um, and of course, Roy should be mentioned here as well. <laughs> okay. So, um, this is just to get rid of this. <laughs> so, essentially, the, the, there are three lines of research that I want to connect here uh, in some very fundamental way. One of them is, is what uh, people usually call scaling laws uh, in human language, which some of them are very old and very well known. Uh, particular the two laws that I want to explain and somehow relate to and give a more fundamental uh, understanding of it. One of them is known as Hipp's law. I actually learned only last uh, week that it has a name. I've actually been working on this question for many years and it's actually named after Hipp's uh, 1978. I'll mention it in a second in, in detail. It's essentially is telling us something about the size of language. I mean, how, much, how many words are there in a natural language and really answering it in in a very intriguing way, at least for linguists, that the language is fundamentally infinite. I mean, there are many words that always occur, and the rate of occurrence of new words is very irregular. It's, it's essentially obeying a very, a very precise power law. So this is what is known as Hipp's law. The other one is uh, no, it's much more, much more famous and known as Zipp's law, and due to a, a German psychologist actually, uh, we actually mentioned it in a paper in 1949, but I've been talking about it since uh, the 30s, and it's becoming a very profound piece of information that is true for many, many things, not just language. So I'll explain this in a second and what we mean by this. It's really the scaling of what's called, what is called rank versus frequency of words in language, uh, and it's not only language, as I said, I mean, it's you can think about it as the scaling of the probability of words with certain frequency, which is a very classical, uh, now, now considered a classical signature of self-similar phenomena. And, and then I'm going to talk about uh, some new, uh, not so new, but new, new to the world, certainly scaling law, which we discovered uh, through the work of uh, Norm and others uh, in, uh, about 10 years, 15 years ago, which I call the IB power law of language, or the complexity versus predictive accuracy in language, and this is where our story starts. And then I try to convince you that you can actually understand it through some sort of a, complete, a very concrete model of uh, Gaussian processes in infinite dimension, uh, which have some self-similar structure. And then I'm going to relate the whole thing to, to another topic, which is ideally as fundamental, which is the connection between our perception of time and information. So uh, this is actually a separate talk that I could give on its own. Uh, but uh, so, so there's some very interesting insight that, again, started uh, many years ago with, uh, I mean, uh, people have been thinking about time and our perception of time since the beginning of time, I suppose. But uh, uh, of course, time is a fundamental notion in physics, and it's been changed significantly in the 20th century in various ways. I'm not going to talk about the physical time. Actually, we really want to talk about how we should, how we perceive time, and how is this related to those scaling laws. So, so one thing I'm going to mention is the connection between time and information through something we call the predictive information. And this is a notion that uh, 
Bill Bialik and I as I proposed about 15 years ago. And actually, so very, again, very natural how much information is in the past about the future. In some, fundament in some fundamental sense, I'll show you that, that there's some scaling, some non-trivial sub-extensive properties of this information. And what I'll show today for the first time is how this, uh, how one fundamental assumption that I'm making about the evolution of language or the development of language and, and the relation uh, between those time scales and uh, the time scales that appear from predictive information and the, the way words are generated. And this is what I call the central assumption, the fisheye assumption, which is actually related to very basic cognitive properties, which I believe are very important, like the size of our working memory and uh, the way we really think about the future and the past, by the way. So there's a completely dual uh, picture here of the way we perceive the past and the way we think about the future. This, this part is, is really mostly the result of uh, what is summarized nicely in a paper with Pedro Ortega last year. It's still unpublished, unfortunately, but we know already it's going to appear in PNAS sometimes soon. So, uh, and then uh, this is related to something which I call the renormalization of, uh, of the Bellman equation. This is a little bit more technical, so I, I, I think I'll, it depends on you, I maybe skip it, but it's the idea that words are generated on different time scales in somewhat constant rate is, is very fundamental and I'll try to explain it slowly so that everything is clear. And then I'll show you how Hips and Ziff's law are actually <coughs> explained and connected through this uh, uh, hypothesis that words are generated by prediction. And, and then the, 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 th the third part, which I, I believe I will not have time at all to talk about, even in the one hour that I'm giving here, is really another layer of understanding that we been pursuing in the last uh, few years with several of the new students and others is the connection between all this and dynamical processes. I mean, how, uh, how these statistics of words really reflect some internal dynamics of the system. This is uh, deeper and more complicated technically to understand. And what we can do now more or less on some uh, really preliminary way is to connect uh, this Gaussian process that I'm going to explain in the first part with the dynamics of linear system with the Gaussian noise and, and show you how, uh, in principle, this self-similarity that we see in language can be explained not only if words are generated on different time scales, as I s I'm going to say in the, in the second part, but uh, if there is an underlying dynamical system which increases its dimensionality with these time scales and that every new word or new concept that appears in language is fundamentally related to essentially a pair of eigenvectors, <laughs> left and right eigenvectors of some matrix, which we call the Henkel matrix of, uh, in the case of linear system. And essentially it explains not only why words appear that way, but also uh, some very, very fundamental facts about language, why verbs really describe actions in some fundamental way and why nouns really describe percepts and sensations and, some, and one day, why they appear together, or maybe appear together in some regular manner, that uh, because there is one recursion or repeated dynamical system that appears on all scale. And I'll show you it very briefly. I know it's not complete, so the, the last part is really just a promise at this point. Okay, so uh, the first uh, scaling law, which all of you should know, is really an answer to the question, how many, how many words are there? What is the size of the language? And indeed, I mean, it, it's surprising. I, I talk about it a lot in popular talks. I mean, my way of, of talking about science is first to give a popular talk to, <laughs> you know, n novice audience, and if they are convinced, then I go to a serious talk. <laughs> and, and then if they are convinced, I write a paper. But it's, it's not really the right way of doing science, by the way. But uh, when I talk, uh, uh, when I give it, I usually ask, if, if, what, how many words do you think are there in a language? So, you know, people throw numbers, uh, the size of the Oxford Dictionary, the size of this dictionary, the size of Google, I don't know. <laughs> but actually, there are, there are uh, so this is known, as I said, for some, some, some long time, that if you actually plot, just read the natural text, like uh, start to read Wikipedia, or anything like this, which is long enough, billions of words, 
and just count essentially, whenever you see a new word, which can be, by the way, just a new string, I mean, www, or no, something like, not necessarily word by any, any real uh, natural uh, linguistic definition, anything which is separated by uh, spaces or, or punctuation. Uh, I, I don't care about morphology, I mean, I don't care about, uh, I mean, the same word can appear in different shapes and form. Forget it, this is all prefactors. If, if you just talk about how many words are just the size of the dictionary, uh, the size of the corpus, I mean, I just read and keep counting, and this is the size of different words. Whenever I see a different string, I erase the counter here. So how do you think this curve looks like? I mean, this is a clever irritation uh, audience, so, so obviously uh, you should uh, guess that it's not saturating. Uh, it's actually not only not saturating, it seems to, of course, there is a fast increase at the beginning because when you start reading the text, essentially every word, almost every word is new. But uh, once you get beyond a certain point, this seems to slow down. But it slows down in a, in a very in a very regular way. If I plot it in a log-log plot, this is, by the way, something I did uh, on a very small corpus. I mean, a few tens of thousands of words taken from the internet. I'm not even sure which one was it. And then Amir Navot did a long time ago some similar things to the, just as a project. And, and essentially, you, you see very precise, considering the fact that this is a data, natural data, very precise scaling law, which looks a little bit faster than square root. Is it directly related to the frequency of the Yes, it's directly related. I'm going to show you how in a second. This is it's known long for a long time that it's related to the frequency of words, but it's still a phenomenon which is, seems to be curious. I mean, you would imagine that at some point this would saturate. So I'll show you some curves that from some recent papers. This is never saturating. <laughs> Maybe the exponent is, is slowing down a little bit, but it, it seems to be a very regular phenomenon, which essentially tells you that the size of the lexicon, or the number of different words, which I call here the NW, uh, is proportional to the number of words or the length of the corpus to some power, which is usually denoted by B. And then this B is between zero and half, more or less, in most cases. I'll show you that half is a very special case. So uh, uh, it should be larger than half, but actually it can, be, can get very close to half. Uh, uh, again, through the connection with this law, we'll see this in a minute. So, so the size of the language is infinite, and it's growing, keep on growing in a regular manner. This is one basic phenomenon that I want to explain today. Yeah, so this is an artifact. I mean, uh, it's not true. I mean, you, you have to, it's true, of course, that if you are bounding the number of words by, let's say, 20 characters, then it's not more, not more than 26 to, to 20 or something like this. But this is an asymptotic <laughs> bound that you can keep. I, actually, it's, it not, even this is not true because just look at the Internet today and you'll see that the size of the alphabet has grown dramatically. We now have uh, strudels and uh, print, all sorts of strange signs that appear as new, as, as new as new characters, and uh, they appear all the time. I mean, <laughs> it seems it's not just a fluke. It's, it's there. It's a very fundamentally there. Yes? Well, it's related. <laughs> it's better to be a little slightly more, more precise than that. I mean, not much more. <laughs> But uh, yes, it's related to some statistical physics phenomena, of course. But how exactly? <laughs> so uh, I just want to show you that it's not just English. I mean, we did this for many different languages. And it seems to me sometimes it goes closer to half. Sometimes it goes further than half. But th this is very, a very crude uh, measurement that we did in my lab. And actually, uh, this is uh, taken from a nature paper of some very distinguished pe people <laughs> from 2012. Actually, this paper really made me think that I really have to publish all this because if these serious people can publish a paper in Nature about a very small subset of what I'm going to tell you today, maybe I should not keep it in my, to myself anymore. So uh, anyway, this is, uh, again, they did it for, on a huge database, something like 200 years of literature. They somehow got some Google statistic of words from 
1800 to 2010 or something, <laughs> of all books that are there or something, and in many, many different languages, and you see very nice scaling law, and actually they observe, because of this really huge data, that there are really two regimes with two slightly different exponents, and this, their paper, I mean, uh, this group, uh, I mean, no Shlomo Havlin and Stanley and many others, but uh, those people uh, explain it in, uh, they really focus on these two regimes which I don't see, I never went so far, but this is, this is really billions of, uh, of words. So it seems not to saturate. Maybe there is some cooling down effect of language, as they call it, but this is a very fundamental and, and very well-known phenomenon. The other law is what is known as this law. This law is essentially trying to answer the question, what is the distribution of words? And it's doing it, of course it was discovered by chance, <laughs> Uh, not exactly by asking this question, but they do it by plotting essentially what they call the, the frequency rank relation, where frequency is the number of occurrence, frequency of a word in, in a corpus, in a finite corpus, is simply the number of times this word appears there. So if a word appears once in the corpus, at a frequency one, if it appears twice, it has a frequency two, it actually, and so on. And, and, uh, and then you'll ask, how many words are there with frequency f? And then what they, when, which they call more or less the rank, and they are ranking it according to frequency. Uh, actually, you can think about it as the probability of the frequency. How, what, is the pro what is the likelihood to find a word that has a certain frequency in a word? And uh, in, in a corpus, in a given corpus. It's important that it's a given corpus. A corpus can be, can be large, but it's a given corpus. And what you see, this is again my plot of this law for the Bible. It's not very nice. It's still uh, convincingly. Of course, what, you, what, they ask, what they argue is that the log frequency versus log rank, or long rank versus log frequency, is a straight line, more or less, with the with the power close to minus one. It's actually higher than minus one for most real languages. So something like this probability of a frequency proportional to the frequency to some minus zeta, as, as they usually call this exponent, and, and this exponent is one, one point, between one and two, sometimes even larger than two. Now, this, this is known for many years, and there have been many, many theoreticians that uh, explain this, this law uh, using all sorts of arguments. Some of them more convincing, some of them. It's maybe, maybe the most, the most uh, complete theory of this law is, is due to Mandelbrot uh, from 1961 or something, uh, with, uh, uh, which related to the effort of storing new words. So essentially, this law comes from an assumption of constant power, or constant. Uh, cost per new word in some sense with some minor assumption. It's a very simple scaling law, at least with minus one here, it's known as the one over f law, and, and it's uh, very closely related to scaling laws of noise uh, in, in some systems. Uh, and actually, it's fundamentally related to the property of self-similar structure. You can derive it in two lines by assuming that your distribution is invariant with respect to scaling, and just take the derivative with respect to its scale, and you get very nice diff law with minus one. No, notice that minus one here means that, that you can't have infinite num number of words because it's, it's, uh, it's not converging as a distribution. So it has to have some, some cut off somewhere, but any, anything above one actually is, is, is normal, normalizable and you can uh, talk about infinite words. So uh, again, just from the same paper by Havlin et al, uh, this is uh, this law again for many, many languages and you see again they they see uh, different regimes, one, one with one exponent and another one very close to two. I don't want to, again, you see it only when you, took, when you take really huge data, you see this bend. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to, I'm, I'm focusing on first regime first, where actually the, 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 number of, uh, the number of words is really uh, uh, unlimited as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so I want to explain the first part, maybe the only part, of this talk, which I'm really going to tell you in great detail, is uh, how is this related to the notion of prediction? So, as you, as many of you know, I've been focusing for many years now on the idea that predictability is really the fundamental aspect of life. Uh, and uh, this is something which I, I'm so convinced of that I really take it as something like a first principle. Uh, or, or if you want, uh, I even define to be a little bit more provocative, define life as, as the, the systems that exploit the predictability of the environment for the benefit. 
Now, it's a bit tricky. What do I mean by this? But just thinking about it, the physical systems that exploit predictability, so there must be something there in the system which appears on short time scales as non-causal. And this is something which uh, Daniel Kalani is sitting there <laughs> and I are trying to think about very seriously these days. But non-causal means that the, the near past doesn't really explain the behavior. There's something in the future. I, I can't solve it like a physical system where you give me initial conditions that propagate the equation. Uh, I need there's some information from the future that is not causal in the sense that the system is not completely explained by past, uh, past initial conditions. There's some information from the future which affects the current behavior. And uh, so, for example, in this case, I mean, they both try to predict where both of them will be at some point, and a slight, a slight change in, the, in, in their prediction can, uh, can be very, can affect their life quite dramatically. So uh, it, it's really a, a fundamental way of thinking about life is summarizing the past for the future. Uh, and, and, and surprisingly, you can actually take this principle and, and, and turn it into a mathematical law, which is quite simple. <laughs> and, and simple enough to, to actually calculate things explicitly, but rich enough to really get you interesting uh, structures. This is precisely what you're all after, aren't we? So uh, in some sense, uh, the idea is, is and as many of you know, I mean, so and many of you have seen this before, more or less, if you take some finite past of your per perception and memories, whatever, what we are trying to do, all of us, all organisms at all levels, is to summarize, summarize this past in a concise, concise way efficiently. So many things here are irrelevant, as, as we're going to see, such that some future, future is going to be well predicted. So everything is this. And this is what I call the information button principle, but uh, you can call it whatever you want. These internal representations are really interesting in the sense that they really tell us most, what must be there, what must be represented in our brain in order to achieve some sort of accuracy or accurate or valuable behavior. Of course, the interesting question as far as we're concerned is really how does this, uh, what is this representation scale with the sizes of these windows? because we're talking about scaling laws eventually at this point. And to make it even more con con concrete at this point, I'm actually thinking now about text. So predict the information of text if you want. You're talking about very large uh, corpus, again, <laughs> a lot of words. They are, they are uh, aligned together. I'm not manipulating the text in any way. Of course, I can choose some sort of statistics, like bag of words, which is a, an extremely simple way of thinking about text, or more than that. Uh, but, but in principle, I'm just taking a very long test, and I'm asked the, the very simple and I believe very important cognitive question, which is, what do we know when you read a certain, let's say, thousand words of uh, the book? What is our prediction, or how much we really know about the next paragraph? I'm not talking about the next word. This is too easy. <laughs> or the, uh, it's, it's really, what is it about? It's really this high-level prediction that I'm thinking about. Uh, so if, if you... You know that this book was talking, this last chapter was talking about scaling laws in language. <laughs> the next one is going, probably going to be related in some higher level sense, even if you can't really tell me exactly what words are there. So it turns out that you can actually do this type of experiment, and we actually did it a long time ago with, uh, with Noam Slonin, although we didn't do it in a predictive way, but it's not really important now. And the way we do it, and I'm going to run through it very quickly, we, we, we apply this principle of what I call the Batnick principle, how much we can compress the past without losing information about the future, uh, but we do it gradually. I mean, so th this is a, again, this is something many of you heard, so I'm going to go through very quickly through it. Essentially, it's just solving a variational problem. I want to minimize the information that is contained in my representation without losing too much information about the future, which means I'm going to compress as much as I can the future uh, with keeping the information, of, uh, the, I'm sorry, the past, keeping as, as much as I can the information of the future. Surprisingly, this is something I can solve, in, at, least, uh, at least in principle, and in many cases also in practice, by simply minimizing this Lagrangian, so T here, a very ambiguous notation. I'm going to use T for time. And so this compressed X, if you want, or this internal representation, this statistics, is uh, 
is simply generated by minimizing this uh, mutual information between the past and the representation. I didn't define mutual information. I hope that all of you know what it is. Subject to a constraint, which some Lagrange multiplier, uh, of the mutual information that P has about the future. And F, F is the past in this case. That's a very complex variable, of course. <laughs> that I need some, some sort of representation of it. And how we do it, it's really not so important at this point. What is really important for me to, to mention or to emphasize is uh, as, as, that I'm actually making in this, in this type of calculation no assumption whatsoever about the joint distribution of X and Y. So it can be anything. There's no modeling assumption. There are many, many models of word generation, for example, the LDA, Latin, the, the Richelieu allocation, or whatever they call it, uh, which is some sort of an explicit statistical model of how words can be generated using, using actually self-similar assumptions. I don't want to make it. I don't want to assume a model because then I will never know if what I see is the property of the language or the property of my model. It would be very hard to separate. But what is really nice about this type of calculation is that you can really summarize it in a very nice uh, plot, which we call the information curve, or, the inform in, or, or plotting an information plan, which is really how much information about the future you get for a given number of bits that you keep about the past. And this, this has uh, the following mathematical pro mathematically provable properties. It has a, an upward concave shape. The derivative is decreasing. Uh, and the derivative is actually exactly 1 over this uh, Lagrange multiplier beta, as you can easily verify. It has a finite slope at the origin, so uh, if because of what we call the data processing inequality. So the information about that T has about Y can never be more than the information that T has about X. So which means that th th this in this uh, plane, there's some finite critical beta in the language of physicists, below which you are not going to see anything. So what we actually do is some sort of an annealing. When we start from very uh, uh, low beta or high temperature, and, uh, and uh, don't see anything, of course, and, and it starts cooling, increasing beta, and then at some critical beta, the curve starts to, to climb. And then you get an interesting set of points which uh, we found, you, you find that some sort of phase transitions in the structure of, the <coughs> of the, this conditional distribution. Essentially, you get either cluster splits, if you allow them to split, of course. If you don't, you don't allow them, they will not split. But if you al allow your clustering scheme to to have uh, hierarchies, or if you, in the case of finite dimension, of infinite, of continuous models, you actually see dimensionality change. So all these interesting points are some sort of phase transitions that occur on this curve that uh, essentially define it completely. I mean, if we know the phase transitions, we know essentially everything. And uh, th this, this is where this, the interesting structure of it uh, appears. And by the way, if you don't plot this in these very specific units of information versus information, you're not going to see the scaling laws that I'm going to show you. So it's really important when you look for scaling laws to plot them correctly. And what we did for, for this, the predictive structure of language, and with Noam Sloan a long time ago, we saw a, a cascade of algorithms. Noam had uh, originally a very, a very trivial algorithm which I never thought would work. It's called the agglomerative bottleneck. Just <laughs> grouping together in a, in a greedy way the clusters of words, and you get with this you get this nice set of clusters, the, the blue curves, and then we did something much more refined uh, with soft clustering and got this red curve of clusters. Again, text versus text. That's essentially what we had. Te text versus topic of text. How much, how much you can predict the topic. And then I thought, okay, this red line is very, very too regular to be, not to say something. Then we actually calculated, but using the equations that you get from this uh, variational problem, and the, this, the, this purple line, which is the theoretical, if you want, but actually is the true limit of those clusters. You can never find clusters above it. This is the information theoretic limit. And we did this, and the information theoretic limit looks too regular to me. So we played with it a little bit, and you immediately see that if you <laughs> reverse it, I mean, turn it on the diagonal, so this is now going there, and this is going there, this is going to be a parabola, more or less. And uh, if you plot this in a log-log plot, you're surprised, you get a very nice, almost amazingly accurate uh, linear curve or power law, with again power which seems to be suspiciously close to 2. Uh, and I, for many years I thought this is probably just approximately 2, and there's probably nothing, nothing interesting about it. It might be some, 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 some sort of a trivial, 
statistical phenomena. This is the first thing that any physicist will think about. But uh, this is maybe a diffusion of some sort or something like this. But uh, no. So first of all, the first thing you want to make sure is what you... By the way, you d we do some normalization here. I mean, you normalize it by the entropy this curve, and you normalize this by the entropy of x. That's here you normalize by the mutual information of x and y. So everything is between 0 and 1, and you get a very nice uh, function. But as I said, again, I mean, you are not going to see this function if for some reason you decided to plot it in, in square error or in a whatever, some arbitrary unit. It's going to screw it completely. So uh, first of all, is it real? So I, I'm, I'm actually arguing that this is very real. And uh, the way we did it, I mean, this is mainly done with Dimitri Davido. We actually tested it on many real world uh, languages, something like 40 different languages. Uh, yes. Uh, X set is what used to be T. I mean, this is the compressed version of X. This is my uh, original notation, but some people don't like the hat. I mean, uh, so they <laughs> some of my students use T and Z and all sorts of other lang other letters which are reserved for other things. So it's really <laughs> okay, but. Uh, X hat is T for all purposes. <laughs> so this is the compressed version of the path, if you want. Now, uh, so first, the fir first of all, before I tell you what the power law means in this case, the, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, is this a real phenomena? And as I said, I mean, we actually found it uh, first for Russian, completely independently done by Dimitri on an entirely different data set. We got essentially the same curve, uh, <laughs> almost the same power. And then we did it for many, many different languages. And this, this language, by the way, are coming from uh, a collection of, of, of the documents labeled by the topic that we got from some company. It used to be called Bunter, but it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, that you, they, they try to do a CRM, customer, customer relation man management, and essentially, uh, essentially try to predict where to put, which folder to put your email. <laughs> and uh, and that, so we got tons of data of labeled emails, <laughs> which uh, helped us uh, doing this. Uh, Again, it's not exactly what I want in terms of predictability, but this, believe me, is, uh, is good enough. And what, of course, we also did is tried it on non-languages. <laughs> I mean, things that are generated by some model like LDA or things that have some pruning of the words. <laughs> For example, a lot of people like to cut, cut the low-frequency low words because they cannot be important. Huh? So if you just cut the 5% the, the low-frequency words, you completely screw this curve. I mean, so it seems to be very sensitive to to all sorts of standard stemming, pruning, all sorts of things that people do to words which are not, what, not good. <laughs> they destroy the scaling. So this eventually convinced me completely that we're talking about a real phenomenon. So the question is, what does it mean? So first of all, power law has a self-similar properties, as all of you probably know. So essentially what it means is that if I take the, any subset of this curve and just stretch this point linearly to this point, the same curve will appear again. This is true for any power law. It's obvious for things like straight line, but it's true for any power. Uh, so uh, a power law is self-similar in a very fundamental sense. So let me, let me use this self-similarity to, to actually uh, argue that I know something about the underlying distribution. And in order to do this, we, we use the one special case of the bottleneck problem that is completely solvable. This is, again, due to the, the work of Amir Globuson, which is, again, missing my talk. Uh, no, actually, I asked him to be here. But uh, Anyway, the, the work of Amir Globuson and, and, and Gal Chechik and, and others who worked on this in 15 years ago. So essentially, if, if the joint distribution of X and Y is Gaussian, is multivariate Gaussian, so think about X and Y as high-dimensional Gaussian, think about Y as some fixed dimension, which is the dimension of the topic that I want to uh, predict, and some uh, x to be a very large dimension, which, is, uh, which I'm trying to compress. Then, this, the same principle boils down to a very familiar problem, uh, which is known in the statistics literature as canonical correlation analysis. So canonical correlation analysis is essentially just linear regression in disguise. It's, it's high, high dimensional linear regression in some sense. It's if you're trying to predict one variable with the other one, and both of them are high dimension, uh, and you want uh, to find the correlation between them in the most precise way, the best thing to do, the optimal thing to do in, in terms of preserving information, and in this case, also true in terms of preserving uh, the, the, list, the square norm, just because information 
and square norms are really tightly related for Gaussian variables. <laughs> uh, so if, if you just take it, as, as statisticians usually do, to try to minimize the square norm, the, so the least, least square fit, you get essentially the same thing. And this is uh, the CCA, or canonical correlation analysis. And what it tells you, that this uh, variable t, which is again x hat, <laughs> the compressed x, in this case, is a linear function of, of, of t. Just as all of you uh, who did linear regression, even in two variables, know that what you get there is the covariance divided by the variance as the slope of the curve. And, and this is precisely what you get here. So A, in some sense, is really the covariance, or the conditional covariance of x on y divided by the variance of x in, in high dimensions. And uh, in, in terms of matrices, you get this uh, matrix here, which is known in the literature as the canonical correlation matrix, or the CCA matrix, or whatever you want to call it, which is completely uh, it's a completely simple exercise to see that this is uh, how to derive these two matrices from the joint distribution of X and Y, assuming that both of them is jointly Gaussian. What is really nice about it is not, not only that you get that the optimal projection is a linear, uh, the optimal compression of, the, of, of X is a linear projection in some sense, but you actually get explicit form for this projection. It's made out of a linear combination of of eigenvectors of this CCA matrix. And uh, it's sorted by the magnitude of the eigenvalue. Uh, and the eigenvalue in this case is, if you normalize the, the matrix, all the eigenvalues between 0 and 1. And essentially what you get is the, an explicit form for this uh, coefficient, which looks like this. Uh, so the, the alpha, the co combination, the coefficient of, of the vector vi in this projection of A, uh, is uh, determined by the maximum positive value of this form, beta, where, where you have beta multiplied by 1 minus lambda here, minus 1. And of course, you want positive coefficients here. For, for this, that, oh, you, want, you want the square root of this to be real if you want. So uh, uh, this means that there is some critical value of beta, or set of critical values of beta, which appear, but when, when you increase beta, you get higher and higher minus, so beta, the critical beta really looks like 1 over 1 minus lambda k. So this, these are precisely those phase transitions that I was mentioned. You see, it's just a small Gaussian noise that we have to add to make the whole thing, it's some sort of regularization noise. You can think about it as small resolution parameter. I mean, there are many good reasons to do it. You want to talk about, uh, you're talking about real variables, so you, you don't want to have, uh, you, you need to put some, some floor from zero on the, on the distribution in order to avoid all sorts of ugly things numerically and also to can think about it as regularization. E nothing depends on this noise eventually. I mean, the, the variance of this noise is canceling out the first order. So it's just a regularization. If I want to think about it as a stochastic map. So this is just telling me that Pt given x is this convoluted with the Gaussian, small Gaussian. This is a trick that's done in many, many other fields uh, all the time. So, uh, but it, it doesn't appear here. I mean, and, and it, nothing really depends. What is really interesting is that each of those transitions, I mean, so you get that whenever beta passes this threshold of being 1 over 1 minus one of the eigenvalues, the cluster, which you can think about it as some sort of a Gaussian in one dimension, and this is, so this is, this is very nice, uh, these are very nice plots that Garden Chechik I forced him to plot it, and <laughs> it even appears in the paper that it's very, very confusing, but still I'm using it. So what really happens uh, uh, in this split? I mean, what is really nice is, is that you see that a nice shaped Gaussian is actually, in one dimension, is actually going to be broken into two pieces once this beta crosses, crosses a, certain, uh, a certain critical value, and you're going to have a, a real phase transition, since the two clusters of two dimensions suddenly appear. And you can think about it, how can it happen in high dimensional Gaussian? It's just an emergence of another dimension that become relevant. So simply I'm just discovering the dimensionality of the problem, eigenvalue one after the other. And this is very much or very similar to the way the discrete bottleneck problem splits its clusters. I mean, you have a cluster, and suddenly the variance is about one over the largest component of the cluster, is about one over the temperature. You get a phase transition that splits it into two. Anybody who ever did the hierarchical clustering or hierarchical k-means or anything like this should be familiar with this phenomenon. Now, uh, 
So essentially, it's something which we call water filling. That again, uh, this is uh, Gull's uh, nice uh, slide that I used again, again, again and again. So essentially, you can think about it as as if you are adding water. <laughs> actually, you are do a reverse water filling. You're adding uh, you're adding uh, water to this. Uh, uh, picture of and the eigenvalues, whenever the water or beta goes below a certain eigenvalue, you get another dimension to the system. This water filling is a name that actually was, was coined by Shannon himself, uh, and it, it, it appears in his two fundamental theorems, both in the capacity calculation of, of the Gaussian channel, of the multivariate Gaussian channel, and in the right rate distortion function of the Gaussian variable. Both of them should be familiar to some extent <laughs> to some of you you get exactly this effect, that, that uh, dimensionality increases with a cascade of phase, phase transitions, second order phase transitions like this. So for, for physicists, this is very nice because phase transitions are nice, and if you have many of them, it's even nicer, and you have many, many critical uh, phenomena here. The question, uh, now what happens if this is a similar process? Okay, <coughs> so we actually have a complete description of the information curve in, in this uh, Gaussian case. And you see that it's really made out of this phase transition. If you don't increase the dimension, you're going to be saturate, saturated at some point into finite information. You cannot do more than that. But at this point, there is this phase transition. If you do increase the dimension, you get, you get higher and higher and higher. And eventually, you get this information curve as an envelope of uh, infinitely many or high, any, any number of sub-optimal curves where the dimensionality was not increased. And now you can ask, and, and, and we know, of course, that the slope at the origin is bounded by, it's exactly one minus the first eigenvalue. This is one over one minus the second eigenvalue and so on. So you get a, a cascade of slope changes uh, in this curve that it is completely determined by the spectrum of the canonical correlation matrix. Notice, by the way, that the canonical correlation matrix, which I mentioned, has some gauge freedom, if you want. Uh, I, 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 can, I still have a, a choice of the variance of x, or the covariance of x, which I can tailor to whatever I want. In most of the calculations we did for this paper, for example, we assumed it for simplicity to be unity, or proportional to unity. But actually, I cannot do it when I talk about infinite dimensional uh, systems. And, and this choice of, of the cor correlation matrix or covariance matrix of x is allowing me to play with the statistics of the words eventually. So there's some, there some redundancy here, if you want. I get the same information curve with many different statistics, and I can still play with the covariance matrix. OK. So this is nice. I mean, you have a complete description uh, in this case. And of course, now you can answer the question, uh, when is this curve self-similar? Or when will I get a power law? And I'm sure that any of you, I was thinking about it for a few minutes, uh, will come up with a very simple solution. I mean, so what I should do is scale the curve. And if, if all the curves scales, I mean, if I really can shift it back from one point to another just by linear scaling, so I can take, in particular, two consecutive transitions and scale them one to the other. And then I assume that the whole, the whole curve repeats itself. So essentially, I'm going to stretch one eigenvalue on one slope here. Slope is one, one, of, one of the beta, as you see. Just going to and then assume that the rest of it is simply going to repeat itself. So this is, of course, a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition for self-similarity, but it's good enough for me. So essentially what I do is take two consecutive values here, beta k and beta k plus 1. Uh, and uh, I, I ask, OK, if, this, if there is a constant scaling of this one to this and self-similarity, then this constant scaling will repeat, will shift essentially all the eigenvalue one, uh, all the eigenvalue one step backwards. OK, is this clear? It's very simple. Again, to the physicists here, this should remind, and that's why we call it renormalization, because essentially, it's rescaling the system and get the same system again. And, uh, and in this case, uh, it's a real renormalization in some sense, and it's related to this renormalization of the Bellman equation. But uh, the first thing you get out of it is that the scaling of two temperatures or inverse temperatures goes like one over the scaling of two eigenvalues, and it should be some constant greater than l one. And if, if there is real self-similarity, this constant is the same constant everywhere. OK, so now you have the complete answer. Power law information curve is generated by an infinite dimensional Gaussian system 
such that all the eigenvalues, first of all, in infinite dimension, I need, I need all of them. And, uh, and uh, so in some sense, which I'm going to be vague about at this point, uh, human language looks like an infinite dimensional Gaussian process, uh, self-similar Gaussian process, at least as reflected by this information. Of course, I'm not saying that we are talking in Gaussian noise. I mean, if Ellie will come to me and say, where is the Gaussian noise in my, my speech? I have to look for it. It's there, by the way. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's not that, not that, I'm not talking at that, at that level at all. It's some really vague similarity of, uh, uh, it's not just the self-similar properties of the language. Okay, so this is the second, the end of the, the, this, uh, this first part, and, and now I, now, I, I now want to, wow, I now want to uh, talk about time again. I'm, I'm out of time. So time, uh, time is, uh, as I said before, a fundamental concept. And if you ask yourself how much of the future is predicted by the past, in general, so it's quite remarkable that you can really answer this question <laughs> on a very general setting. If the only thing you assume is stationarity, and that this is a process that is statistically independent of time, which, which means that the distribution is independent of time, uh, of time sheets, then you can easily think about uh, Again, very simple uh, mental exercise. You know that the end, if, if, if this is a stochastic process, it has a, a constant entropy rate. Constant entropy rate means that the entropy of is proportional to time, okay? Or the log of the number of configurations is, 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 is linear in time, which means that it has exponential number of configurations. This is what the, the origin of entropy. Now, entropy is also extensive which means that if I take very long precess here, the entropy of the joint should be essentially the sum of the two entropies. Okay, this is what all physicists learn. <laughs> so entropy is extensive, but we all know, and I'm sorry that I refer to physicists here, but I look at Jonathan and Joram all the time. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really physicists. Uh, this is what, where we come from. So essentially, uh, not only Joram, I mean, there's a few others <laughs> who come from physics, so, but if I'm not clear, tell me. So essentially, uh, the... The entropy is extensive, and uh, which means that the total entropy is to a first approximation the entropy of this piece plus the entropy of this piece, and everything on the boundary cannot contribute anything. So the, the mutual information in particular to first order, or the extensive part of the mutual information, is simply the sum of the two entropies minus the, the entropy of the sum, as, as you all know, I mean the sum of the joint, uh, and this is zero to first order. But there is obviously information there. So the mutual information must be subextensive. This is the, the proof. Any, any mutual information, any information that really connects the past and the future, must not scale linearly with time. So this is something, this was the first observation that Bill Bialik and I made in Woods Hall at one evening many years ago. <laughs> uh, and and we, we then uh, started to investigate this a little more closely, and it turns out that you can really classify the way the future affects the past, uh, sorry, the past affects the future, in any stochastic, stationary stochastic process into two categories. And essentially what happens is, of course, the, the near future is highly constrained by the, the near past. But when you go further and further, those constraints dilute. And this, of course, even without assuming that there's some underlying dynamical system. If there's an underlying dynamic, then you can think about this dynamic as, as steering the, the boundary in some sense and uh, creating some local effect there. And when you get further away, this effect disappears. But the question is, how, it, how does it disappear? And, and, and what we know, this is Bill and Elian Emmerman, that uh, if you actually do this for uh, any stationary process, uh, this mutual information between past and future has two fundamentally different behaviors. One of them is what we call the finite parameter. Uh, for, for example, a Markov chain with finite number of, of, of states, or uh, any, fi any finite parameter stochastic process will have a scaling load that's predicted information will scale logarithmically with time, which is very, very slow. Yeah? And which means essentially that, and, and, and the pre-factor here is essentially the dimensionality of the process over two, and many of you should recognize this term as the stochastic complexity or the description length, the minimum description length, or many other names where this appears. This essentially what happens here is that all the, all, all, all the information within the past and the future is passing through the description of the parameter. If I give you the parameters, the two things are independent. Think about the coin. The coin flip, for example, is a very simple case. 
if you don't know the distribution of the coin, the probability of the coin to be up or down, IID, then there is information, of course, because I can estimate this probability from the past, but the information is not more than the number of bits that I can ask and, and answer about the parameter. And this scales like one over the square root of the sample size by Kramer rarer few more something like this, which means that the number of bits is log of this or half log the sample size. So half log the sample size per parameter is precisely, actually I talked to you about this just a while ago, is precisely the number of bits by Kramer Rao that you can answer by looking at some pass window of size t about the parameters of the process. So this is very simple to understand. Uh, correlation is, is part of the mutual information, and not everything is correlation. So obviously it's going to be smaller. It's a, it's a bound on the correlation. But uh, actually correlation is going to scale exactly the same, maybe in the different free factors, in, in a real valued process. Yeah. But what is interesting, and much more relevant to our question now about language, is that f there are processes with infinite dim dimensions, and, and language is one like this, and you can, if you look at this paper with Nemenman and Bialik uh, from 2002, and we have many different examples, very interesting examples of processes like this, which are infinite dimensional. By the way, I mean, our reviewer, which I now know to be Tom Cover <laughs> at that time, rejected this. I mean, he said there are no processes like this. I mean, it was really horrible because the information theorists somehow thought that uh, there are only finite dimensional processes. I, I was completely amazed by this. Actually, he went to Stanford to talk to Tom about it and uh, convinced him <laughs> that there are processes in the world which are not finite dimensional, where this predictive information goes like a power law with a power less than 1, between 1 and 0. And actually, a very interesting case is the square root of t. And again, those of you who know learning theory, something we, we spend a long time explaining in this paper, the derivative of the, if the predictive information curve is directly related to the training, to the gen generalization error in learning. So in the log t curve, you get 1 over t decrease of error. So this is a 1 over t learning curve. And, and the... And the square root of t, for example, will give you 1 over square root of t, a learning curve, which is a very common learning curve for many, many real value phenomena where you have what you call unrealizable. You can't really get to the point. You only can approximate. And there are actually many other power laws here. Okay, so uh, power laws are very interesting. So let me, fast, uh, let me move a little faster. Now I'm making a, a very deep conce a big conceptual jump. I want to relate this predictive information curve to our perception of time. This is a long story, and actually has many different layers as far as I'm concerned, but the, the upshot of it is very simple. I mean, when we make predictions, this again, the, the paper with uh, Pedro is all, all, mostly about that. Uh, when we make predictions, we should, and I think now about the future, there's absolutely no reason for me to try to think about long time future in more, in higher resolution that is provided to me than with my current information. So let's say if, if I'm planning a tour, saying where, where I'm going to be in which hotel on the 31st of August is a little bit of an overfitting. <laughs> I mean, I, I may have all sorts of uncertainties on the way which will prevent me. So if you're trying to overfit the future, you're going to fail miserably. So what we usually do, all of us, because this is very natural for us, actually, I actually, actually claim that this is one of the most fundamental properties of cognition is that we don't think about the future in the same resolution. We actually have very high resolution for the near future. And the further we go into the future, the less we assume and how much less we can assume. But that's precisely the predictive information, I mean, or at least bounded by the prediction information because not all the predictive information is valuable for us. So maybe there are things that I can predict which are completely irrelevant, <laughs> so forget them, <laughs> but it's a bound on, on the valuable prediction information. Actually, we spend a lot of time calculating valuable prediction information. I'll say something about it in a minute. So in some sense, the way we must think about the future is in, not in terms of uniform time, but in terms of uniform information. Why is that? Because this means that, okay, I, I have some delta i, and I, I'll relate this delta i to working memory in a second. So essentially, we have some bits that we can really think of currently, keeping our cache memory in some sense. And, and, and the two to the two to delta i, essentially how much complexity I allow at each state. And, and if everything is bounded by some sublinear curve, then I am forced, whether I like it or not, to think about growing and growing time intervals. So I have the same information about this, t plus one, 
and this, and this, and this, where this is the valuable information curve. And if you're not clear about what is valuable information curve, I can play the same exercise by replacing future information with value in the future, and then play essentially a rate distortion type of argument and have a value inf valuable information. So, uh, so this is interesting. How is this related to language? Again, I have to come back to this. So my bold assumption is that in order to think about the future, we actually need words that describe those different intervals. So we actually need to name it. Uh, we, we, we need to give concepts to events and states that happened on longer and longer timescales within this resolution. So here is my key assumption, is that the number of words that appear in the language really scale like, appear in a constant number for every step of this hierarchy. So two to the delta i words will appear here, and then another two to the delta i words will appear here, and then another two to the delta i words will appear here. Now, if you buy this, why? Because you actually need to concisely be able to think about long time future. So first of all, there is really this nice observation that we made with, with Pedro last year, that even just in terms of predictions, if you're thinking in uniform time, if time scales with, like uh, Newton told us, uh, Einstein is irrelevant at this point, unless you're moving very fast, but, um, or you're in very high gravity. But otherwise, Newton is good. So uh, it's, uh, it's really scaling uh, uniformly with time, but this is giving us a lot of overfitting or uncertainties about where we are going to be here. And essentially, your predic prediction cones, and think about ages, histories, and FS futures, what you can able to predict with the same computation power is very, very different here than in this case where you actually scale time with information, where you get very, very nice uh, cones. You actually cover a lot more possible futures when you think about time as expanding uh, with information. This is a theorem that we proved with uh, Ortega, with Pedro, and uh, I think is, is actually showing us that there's a very good reason for organism to think this. Okay, so we have this, uh, what I call time fisheye. I mean, essentially, our perception of time is curved. We have very high resolution near, near in the near past and future, and when we go further and further into the past or the future, completely symmetrically, we have a curvature of our memories and our resolution, which uh, scales with the predicted information curve or just correct it with the valuable predictive information, but this is something we know how to do. So this is a very nice principle. How, to, how do I take it to language again? So I already said, this assumption alone, I mean that words are generated according to the amount of information in each of these levels of the hierarchies, two to the delta i is the number of new words I should add at each level, already explained and uh, hip and zip, which is something uh, I discovered recently. But it's very, very nice. So essentially, I'm saying that the key hypothesis is that two to the delta i, new words are generated at each level. If you want to argue about it, this is the time to argue. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is what I take as an assumption. And I, I'll justify it later on. I, not today, probably. <laughs> but, uh, delta i is something which I find very interesting. So delta i is really telling me what is the cognitive resolution. I mean, what is it that we need to keep in our cache memory? And the natural candidate for that is working memory. The little I know about working memory, but uh, maybe it's some part of the working memory, uh, some little part. Actually, you know psychologists, I, I don't see many of them here, but they really tell you that the working memory is, is amazingly small, I mean, a few bits. By the way, with a working memory of about seven or eight bits, I can al al already have a universal Turing machine which means my, my state dynamic can be an automaton with two to the eight states. So we know, you know that the universal Turing machine, here yeah, I'm talking to a computer scientist, uh, universal Turing machine has uh, essentially a, a, a really this famous celebrated fundamental theorem of Turing is telling us that if you have an automaton with finite number of states, 130 something, uh, it, it's enough to have to be a universal computer, which means that essentially I could have a, a working memory of eight, seven bits and, and do everything. I mean, I don't need more than that. If you think about two to the working memory as the number of states in my short-term internal automaton. So assuming that we have only three or four bits of, of, of work memory is not so bad. I mean, we can have a, a lot of things there. Again, but if only two to the I, delta i new words appear at each level, then 
we already have uh, Hitch's law. Why? Because then the lexicon scales, I mean the number of words in the lexicon, scales like i. Not like 2 to the i. It's like this constant times the number of intervals. At each level of the hierarchy, I add another constant number of words. Which means the size of the lexicon scales like i, but the size of the corpus scales like the time, of course. I see more and more words when I read more and more, spend more and more time. I have a constant time, a constant reading speed. No, going to be arguing with that. But it's all right. <laughs> yes? I'm a bit confused here because we're talking about memory and the corpus of the individual. All right, okay. That, that I, g I agree with you. I'm talking, I'm confusing here. Just you, you can be a lot more precise about the, the language of an individual and the language of the community and the society and the hi of history, of language in general. But if all of us are similar in the sense that we more or less have the same working memory size, at least on average, <laughs> then, uh, then all, of us, and all, of us, all of us should be able to cope with the same language, which means that we can read it at least or, or process it, then we should, there is a, ni a nice connection between the property of the community or the population and the property of the individual, but I don't want to get into it. Okay, you, you yeah, you don't know, but you have passive. Okay, this is actually very, a very interesting point. So I didn't mention it here at all. There is, language has not only self-similar structure, one of the implications of the self-similarity is that it's, it's learnable, or in some sense, even if I don't know half of the word in the corpus, I can still understand something. This is actually the reason why we can talk to a one-year-old child, just as I talk to you, almost, <laughs> and uh, he understands, I mean, at least I think he understands. <laughs> and uh, I did it with my children. <laughs> and actually I get exactly the same reaction when he was one year or when he's 20. <laughs> <laughs> when I talk about my own work at least. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there is something there which you can peel off in some sense and there is really a nice structure that you can, some solid so skeleton of the language that is also scaling that you can get uh, at a different, so even if I erase most of the words, you still get something. And it's amazing how much you get. And this is, again, due to this scaling similarity, in my opinion. So there's learnability. But let me just say how, how heat slow emerge. I think I have to stop very quickly. Yeah. You just mentioned those in relation to Russian. New words are added all the time. Yes. Which word are you? I lost. No. You're absolutely right. And those papers that I mentioned, especially this Nature paper, by talk, talk a lot about it. Yeah, uh, so I can uh, subtract the number of new words from the number of lost words. By the way, we still read the Bible and, uh, and Shakespeare and a few other things <laughs> and get most of it. <laughs> and there are not that many w lost words, but of course you're right. Words mo change their meaning, words do a lot of funny things. So These are all second order effects. <laughs> yeah, because that would actually convert the content. Yeah, so I'm talking about the net, the net growth of, of the lexicon. Okay. And uh, of course, it's all uh, approximate to first order, asymptotic, whatever you want. <laughs> it's really a it's just, a, it's just a back of the envelope calculation, essentially, what I'm doing here. So, uh, so essentially, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, an immediate consequence of this assumption is that the size of the lexicon scales like the predictive information. And the size of the corpus scales like T. So you get the first uh, non-trivial prediction that uh, the exponent of Hitz law is exactly or closely related to the, to the entropy, to the exponent of the information, uh, predictive information growth, and I have to correct it. It's not really predictive information, it's, it's valuable predictive information. But this is uh, something I, I may mention, may not, not have time to understand. Is it possible to understand the entropy in power? It's a good question. <laughs> no, not yet. But I, 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 well, there are differences, obviously differences. Maybe it's a difference in the working memory of uh, different people. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, different the way they think about uh, time. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I can speculate. I, I, let, let me stay to what I think I know. The other one is a little more tricky. How does it relate to Zitz law? So Zitz law, uh, again, if you remember, uh, this will take me more or less all the time that I have. Uh, so essentially, I told you something very fundamental. New words are generated on different time scales because I need to describe the long time future. I didn't tell you much about the distribution of the time scales. 
And maybe I, most of the time I think only about the first two steps. I mean, I have a very short uh, planning horizon. I never think about the next day or the next year. But, but if you are indeed in this self-similar process, there is, you spend in a very regular way time thinking about longer and longer future. This law, by the way, is not telling us, is not answering this question of how, how precisely we, we scale the future. I mean, this is still an open, an open uh, gauge freedom here. Uh, which has to do with the, the scaling of words. I, I'm, I'm more or less done. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to skip the rest of it as well. <laughs> so, um, so if you think about uh, about frequency of a word in this model of generating them into in, in beams of, of growing, growing size, so you're taking now a corpus of size big T, and you ask yourself, what, how many words will appear only once or will be what I call the low, fre the low frequency occurrence. Which, wa which one are there, according to this model? That's something I did last night, so I'm not sure I'm right, so you do it with me. <laughs> uh, so essentially, uh, it's only those where you have enough time to actually see this larger interval. So uh, since some words appear only when I need to describe very big chunks of time, I get... Uh, I get a uh, very nice scaling. I mean, again, I'm thinking about scaling laws. It's only to first order to find the exponents. So essentially, it's the size of the corpus time divided by the largest size of the interval, which I call the, the which is 2 to the i, the, the predictive memory or the, 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 the working memory, uh, scaled in time according to my, uh, my predictive information function. So... Uh, if this is the frequency, the probability of this frequency, so I know, I know, now I, I know how this interval scale, and this is again here, I assume a very explicitly a power law a predictive information curve. So if the predictive information grows like t to the eta, where eta is this number between 0 and 1, uh, play this argument that I just told you, count how many words appear only once, how many words appear twice, how many words appear three times, and so on, based on this assumption of words are generated at each level as exponential of the delta i of this, uh, which, and delta i, I call it working memory until proven otherwise. So it's, uh, you get very nice uh, this law like the probability of this frequency scales like the frequency to a power which is 1 minus eta over eta. Play this. It's a very simple exercise. So is, here's a nice prediction. The, Scaling law of this is simply 1 of minus eta over eta of the predictive information curve, which is, and I said that eta is approximately the, b, the b of the of the Heap's law. So here is a nice connection between these two laws. But this is known. So as I said, I mean... Right. The That's right. That's right. Even if I don't know eta. So first of all, they give, this, is the, this is the prediction. Okay, so, so of course I looked at the literature. This, this relation, <laughs> that zeta should be 1 minus b over b, already appeared in the papers, unfortunately. And there's a recent one, even in PLOS 1, 2010, that's rediscovered. Okay. Actually, it appeared earlier. But, uh, so, so, first of all, surprisingly, the whole thing is still alive and kicking. There's a lot of interest in this type of connecting the scaling laws. But you, they actually do something much simpler. They sample the zip distribution and show that it obeys the Hipps law. This is not a big deal. But so I, I actually sh show you a little more. I tell you exactly what is the relation between the exponents, and I and I actually argue that both of them are derivable from the predictive information. There's one more thing which I <laughs> wanted to mention but have no time, is that predictive information curve, the scaling of time scales, uh, is also at the origin of this renormalization of Bellman, and also explaining the discounting of rewards. This is something I've been saying to some of you a long time ago. So the exponential this discounting of rewards in, in reinforcement learning is directly related to finite dimension of world models and the logarithmic uh, uh, predictive information. And the power, the, what they call the hyperbolic discounting of, uh, of rewards is actually directly related to, to power law information. Okay. All right, now I have to think if I want to sh tell, you, tell you the second half of the story. <laughs> so that's just the, just the gist of it. So, so now encouraged, if you want, by this observation that there is a really tight connection between scaling laws in, in, in language and perception of time. 
and we have actually a generating hypothesis that generates new, new words in, 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 in language according to uh, uh, some really mild, wild assumption about the way we think about the future and the past. It's not so mild assumption, it's actually a very interesting assumption. And actually it has a lot of interesting predictions. I mean, if you really want to do experiments, I'm trying to sell it to Merav and other people, there are many, many things you can actually try to predict from this simple assumption. But one, but actually I'm, I'm more greedy than that. I actually argue that I can explain the whole curve with a, a, what I call the perception action cycle uh, picture, which means that the whole curve should be explained by the way we think about our sensations and the way we think about our actions. So it's not only that new words appear on different timescales, but they appear in a very systematic way due to the, to the need to act and need to describe and sense uh, different timescales in, in, in the world. So we have been playing with, uh, with uh, uh, this theory of uh, uh, perception action cycle for a long time. And Daniel Polanyi, again, who is here, uh, has a lot to, to do with the way we think about it. Uh, and and the, the gist of it, again, is, is that I think now about the interaction of an organism with the world through this model of sensations and actions communicating between two Markov chains. Th this is a very general model of, uh, of perception and action. But now, and of course you can, you can cast it into Bellman and into uh, Kalman filter and uh, all sorts of algorithms like this, which essentially do the same, I mean, compress the, the past in a useful way with respect to the future. And in the case of linear systems with Gaussian noise, the whole thing is, uh, is tractable analytically, which is, again, a, a nice thing to have. So, so I, I'm again, again, so what we now know how to do is to ask what is the minimal communication between the past and the, organ between the environment and the organism, subject to some assumptions about the uh, complexity of the memory which again has to do with this work memory that I saw. And, and, and uh, so you can really plug into this Bayesian model everything that I said about the uh, perception of time. And if you do it seriously, you actually have to connect these three different views of, uh, of prediction. One of them is uh, the automaton that I mentioned earlier. I mean, the, the MDP or POMDP model I didn't mention today, but it's known to all of you. The states and transition between states, which are stochastic. The other one is this communication model. What is the minimal flow of information that I have to go for, to, go to see through my senses in order to act in a useful way? And the third one is this prediction tree model. How much of the past I really need to remember in order to act in a val valuable way in the future? And what is really nice about it is that the whole thing converge very nicely. Let's skip all those details, which, are, which I have said already in, in other cases. And, and, and this minimalization idea of, of, of time really means that you don't think about the future in the same resolution everywhere, but actually after some finite number, some what I call the seed tree or the seed automaton, which has to do with this cache memory, how, much of, how many states I can really hold in my short-term memory, I have to think about the future only in, in these uh, clustered or vague ways. So I only know that I'm going to be somewhere here or somewhere here or somewhere here, but I need this automaton to be, to be recursive in the sense that if I... Now, move in time, this uh, un unpredictable in, in the structure will reveal themselves in a recursive way. So this is precisely the assumption about a dynamical system that is underlying everything. So again, uh, this idea of renormalization uh, can, can be cut into a very precise model of the Bellman equation, where you actually work with new states and new actions, uh, and uh, everything boils down to some renormalized probability of transition, and renormalize policy, and, re and again, those words in the language actually describe those clusters of states and action. So now we can say, so there are clusters of states, of the original states, and, and our percepts of it and descriptors of it, which are much higher level. I know that I'm getting more and more obscure. Never mind. So what is really nice that you can then put yourself again in this corner of Gaussian linear system. I'm out of time. Okay, so just believe me that you can do this completely analytically to some extent and uh, I just get you this goes again back to a work we did with Amir Globelson at the end of his PhD thesis uh, almost eight years ago with uh, yeah, Felix Kutzig and Amir we started to ask this question what happens if there is a dynamical system that connects the past and the future 
of my language. We did it in a more or less, uh, what we already found there is that, that there is a nice factorization of the dynamics into observers and actuators, which emerge as dimensions, but of a different matrix, not of the canonical correlation matrix, but of the, what we call the Henkel matrix. So those of you who have never seen it before will not understand it now, but we saw essentially the same type of curve, phase transitions along, along the information curve, but instead of the eigenvalues of the canonical correlation, we get the eigenvalues of a dynamical system, which are the singular values of this Henkel matrix, which appear together with two vectors. One of them is a sensor or an observer, and the other one is an actuator or an, ac an actor, and these two things appear together according to this theory. Taking it back to language actually tells you that language appears not only in higher resolution semantically, but that this semantic resolution is refined on both verbs and nouns together. Now, this actually takes me back to an observation we had in, uh, in, uh, in with Fernando Pereira back in the 80s, which, uh, which is uh, the observation that we actually see though those semantic clusters of words tend to split together in the same direction at the same time. So there was some dimension of meaning like size or color or smell that all appear together. Anyway, I, I, despite the fact that you gave me one hour, I still couldn't get the whole story completely. But it's a, it's a, I hope that at least the first part was clear. And, and I just want to summarize. So we have the human language exhibits very precise scaling laws. In particular, there's this, this new scaling of, predict that, uh, of predictive information or information from the past about the future, which reveals a, a, as a power law uh, and revealed by the information bottleneck methods in past and future. And this scaling can be explained as a Gaussian representation of a Gaussian process, of infinite dimensional Gaussian process. And if I jump to the end, this infinite dimensional Gaussian process can be related, first of all, to the hierarchy of perception of time in the future and the past, and to the emergence of actuators and observers in a way which is very regular if you think about the whole thing as a dynamical system. And this is where, that's where we stand now. There's a lot of open question and many holes in what I said, especially in the last part, and that is why uh, we had so many good students trying to help me understand it. But I think there is a very nice story emerging. That's really language can be understood, and it's a, a beautiful reflection of the way our memory is constructed and, and, and organized. And there are some very fundamental cognitive properties, like the size of our working memory, and the, the way we store past and future percepts that are reflected in language, it can be studied, you can actually study the brain by analyzing big corpora. <laughs> it's quite interesting. All right, thank you very much. What do I mean the rate of change? The rate of change of a given language? Of the world. Of the no, no, so it's a rate of change not with respect to time, but with respect to usage of languages, the number of words. So those people are very silent. They never talk. I don't know. Maybe there are some people here who don't want to insult anyone. But there are people who talk less than others, let's say. Those will generate new words on a slower pace. Time is not the issue. It's the number of words. If you talk a lot, you generate new words, and the constant rate is with respect to usage of language. So languages which are not used are not generated, are not reborn, of course. When, when Hebrew was dead, in some sense, was not used every day, hardly any new words generated, that is clear. Once we started to use it, we have a lot of new words. But remember that my time scale was always the size of the corpus. I mean, I simply count words. So no real time. I, didn't, I don't know if this is answering your question, but... Okay, so it's, it's, it's of course a very questionable issue whether I can think about text as stationary. But when I take billions of, of words in different completely arbitrary collection of newspapers, books, whatever, as those people did, the assumption of stationarity is not so bad. And I just mix them together somehow. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Actually, they did, a, I mean, those, uh, this, this nature paper I started with did a very careful study of how language changed from the beginning of the 19th century to the middle of the 21st century and there are many, many interesting observations there. To me, I'm just shuffling everything I think about really stationary process. I want to, but I, I, I argue very strongly that this stationary process has in it hierarchies of scales, 
which reveal a lot about the structure of our brain. That is really the message this goes in. Yes, if you give me text o over millions of years, I guess I can say that. 3,000 years. 3,000? Okay, maybe. I, ha I doubt if there's any real change in working memory over 3,000 years, but 2 millions, I'm sure there is. <laughs> no, no, actually, it's a very good question, by the way, because we have archaeologists, but they did another long story, uh, who are trying to or asking me questions like, here are the tools of the society 12,000 years ago here in the Mediterranean. What can you tell me about their language? It's a very interesting question, and you can actually say something about it, but this is a different story. Yes. Yes, so again, one of the theorems that we have in this paper with Pedro Ortega is that there is complete duality of perception of the past and planning in the future. Learning in the past, so essentially there are hierarchies in terms of the way we think about the past, which are completely dual in some sense, I mean, some mathematical duality to the way we think about the future. And actually, it's not a coincidence that you have uh, the same equations, the Bellman equation for planning and the uh, Kalman filter or something like this, or uh, filtering of, 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 uh, of observ observations in the past, which look very similar in any concrete example you look at and actually look really dual in various ways when you think about this duality. And actually, this is, again, a prediction to psychologists stop thinking about perception and memory in one department and planning and behavior in another department, <laughs> look at them as two sides of the same coin. And this is precisely what we're trying to do. All right, I think we have I'll a question. Okay. Yes, I told you already some predictions about the connection between these laws. Uh, Yes, maybe. Uh, no, okay, but now I'm actually relating it to some very concrete, concrete things which are not. So, for example, working memory. For example, uh, uh, um, this connection between verbs and nouns, which I find very striking. I mean, well, the working memory one, one would predict that the, the Japanese working memory is uh, equal to. Uh, yes, yeah, this, is, this is why why it's more or less universal. But By the way, don't take those exponents that I showed you very seriously. I mean, if you actually look again at uh, the paper of Havlin et al., those, uh, I can see everything in reverse, which makes me interesting. Uh, but if you actually take this, uh, what they did is over really a thousands of thousands of, of papers, and what you see is essentially the same this law for all languages. I, mean, I, I see some differences, and I, th I think they're all I mean, bo both for the corpus size versus uh, uh, lexicon size. I mean, there are hardly any, any real differences. So you see a slightly different exponent. Hebrew, Hebrew is slightly more compressed. You have, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't take this seriously. This 0 0.65 here versus the 0 0.52. By the way, I, I, I mentioned that half is a very special number. If, if the Hips law have a, an exponent of half, then the this law, which is 1 minus eta over eta, has an exponent of minus 1, which is precisely the free scaling, which is cited as singularity. So we don't get, we somehow stay away from this. It's interesting. You never see exactly half, and all those that in the upper part where you see lower numbers than half, don't believe them. Don't believe them. I think they're wrong. But uh, anyway, it's describing a different phenomenon. So uh, just answering your question, we're just starting to understand what we're saying. <laughs> but I've been saying it for a long time. You want predictions. There are predictions. But this is why we're staying together, to talk to psychologists and see what can be measured. And what's but it's a, it's a fundamental connection between many different parts of the story. But anyway. Right. Now, this is not a predictive power. This is the rate of the generation of new words. Predictive power is this. Uh, the predictive power is my curve. Yes, so uh, there are hardly any, any significant differences. Some languages are more predictable than others. I don't believe this is to be true. This is the predictive power, if you want. And uh, so you see, 
I don't, uh, it, it, it's, it's a fluctuation of that, let's say. I mean, so for example, I got from Korea some very strange database which turns out to be all military. <laughs> I mean, that, uh, this was some email. So military, military language tend, turn out to be very concise and low, low uh, very, very, very precise in terms of content. So it's highly predictable. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> it, may, it may not be true. It's time to take okay. a copy break and thank you. <laughs>